Test, 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 test.
Test, test. We good? Is that one on? Is it? Scott, is the speaker on? Test, test. Everybody loves somebody. <laughs> For my next selection. Test, 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 okay. <coughs> All right, according to my watch, it is time to go. Uh, good to see everybody tonight. Welcome to class. I uh, want to make uh, an announcement first, and then um, I'll lead us in a word of prayer. But <clears throat> uh, the funeral service for Ernie Barrett is going to be Tuesday. And we had originally said that uh, we were going to feed the family at 1 and have the funeral at 2. Um, but the the um, the cemetery told Sharon that they don't allow any services after three o'clock, and so three o'clock was the latest, which meant um, if we had the service here at two, that was going to make it uh, impossible for them to get there by three. So things have been backed up an hour, and so now the the funeral service is going to be Tuesday at one o'clock uh, here at the Bear Valley Building. And then the, uh, the family is going to be fed uh, prior to that. We've got ladies' Bible class. That's going to be dismissed a, a little bit early. Um, Moria tells me that they could use some help um, getting things set up. We're going to do that before ladies' Bible class. And also bring food or, yeah, also bring food. And uh, then we'll have ladies' Bible class, and that'll dismiss a little bit early and uh, give uh, time to get this room set up for uh, feeding the family, which we're basically, basically shooting to do that around 1145-ish, uh, and then the service upstairs will be uh, 1 o'clock. Have any questions on that, uh, please see Moria uh, and... Um, She'll, she'll be able to fill in the, the blanks on that. Anything else I need to say about that? Anybody else? <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's start off with a word of prayer. Father, it's been a great day, and we're so thankful for the many blessings that you have given us. And we're just thankful to be able to wrap up this day in this way by coming together and just enjoying uh, fellowship with one another and being able to uh, study your word and encourage each other through uh, the pages of your holy book. Father, we're thankful for the, the course of study that we are wrapping up tonight, for the lessons, uh, for the encouragement, for the instruction that is found in the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. And Father, we pray that with every study of your word, there'll be a takeaway. There'll be something <clears throat> that we've learned, something that helps us to uh, be more committed and more faithful to you. And Father, we especially uh, tonight want to offer a prayer on behalf of our uh, sister Sharon Barrett and with the loss of Ernie and the difficulties that she's going through, uh, very stressful times for her not just with the loss, but all of the arrangements and uh, just the complications of that. We pray that you'll comfort her, strengthen her th through this, and help us to be an encouragement to her as well. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> all right, for the last several weeks, we have been doing a study of three books, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. And one of the problems that frequently uh, we have in the study of those books is they get relegated to uh, 
history. They're historical books. And you might begin thinking, I never did like history. Hated history in school, and I still hate it now. Uh, or you might say, well, history is just kind of history, and I find history interesting, not particularly relevant, but interesting. But it is true that those books have some historical things in them. But that is selling the book so short of the real pl plan of God uh, for those books. With any book in the Bible that records history, there's always something there. Something from God, some lesson from God, some uh, point that God wants to see, maybe some application or some link. But our minds should constantly be going uh, through those books asking the question, why did God choose to record that event? And why did he say it in that way? And then if you, you start asking those kind of questions, all of a sudden you recognize, man, this is so much better than just studying facts and dates and names, places, but really seeing the message of God that is flowing through these historical references. You know, these books provide a valuable backdrop to the person and the character and the work of Jesus. And that's what we want to do tonight. We want to talk about Jesus as linked to these three books. Now, there are some people that have said that you can see Jesus on every page of the Old Testament. I'm not a, a fan of that particular saying. I don't think that it's God's plan for us to force a Jesus application on every page. But having said that, there's much in these books that provide a link to Jesus. And we would miss a valuable part of the study if we fail to notice these links. You know, it's true that the Old Testament was designed to lead us to Christ, to point to Christ. And there have been religious groups today that have drawn out doctrines from Old Testament texts that completely leapfrog the time of Jesus and the cross of Christ. And when you've got passages like what Paul says in Galatians 3 and verse 24, that the law was a tutor to lead us to Christ, he's establishing a very important point about the role and function of, in that case, the law, but uh, greater application of the Old Testament. How does the Old Testament bring us to the doorstep of the Son of God? His life and His ministry, His death, and now as He functions as high priest. It's true that the Bible has what are known as types and antitypes. For example, in Romans 5, Paul uh, talks about Adam and Christ, and he says there in uh, uh, Romans 5 that Adam was a, a type of Christ. He said, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even those who have not sinned to the likeness of Adam, uh, of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the New Testament doesn't make types and antitypes. Uh, Michael reminded me earlier today of something that Warren Wilcox said and said frequently is don't start forcing type antitype things in to the Bible. Don't start seeing that. Uh, and that was, a, that was a good warning. And a good application for us as we study is not, not to do that. However, it is true, though, that the New Testament links Jesus with important Old Testament characters, like Moses, like uh, Abraham. And, uh, well... So we can do that, and when we think about these three books, if you were asked, what 
attributes of Christ, what parallels to Christ do you see in the books of Joshua, Judges, and Ruth? Let me narrow it down even further because this is uh, the direction I want to go tonight because uh, we, we could spend a lot more time with this. But if we just looked at basically three characters, if we look at Joshua, we look at Samson, and we look at Boaz, those three characters, if we just zeroed in and focused on them, is there something, even now, just pop in your brain, something about Joshua that you say, I can see a parallel to Jesus. Not that the, we're saying it's a type, any type, as much as I just see a parallel. Anything? His name. All right, his name. Good place to start. Did you know? that Joshua is Hebrew, Jesus is Greek, and they both mean the same thing, Savior. And so there is, by virtue of the name, a link between Joshua and Jesus. And so, Savior. Was Joshua a Savior? Okay, he was, wasn't he? Uh, how, how was he a Savior? Well, he... We think Savior, Deliverer, those two words are uh, kind of synonyms to each other. And Joshua was certainly one that you could say was a deliverer of God's people. You know, you've got the epic account of uh, Israel's conquest of Canaan. That's a favorite for many people. Uh, I know that I love the account of the, the conquest of Canaan. I always have. Um, you've got these larger-than-life miracles that make the book of uh, Joshua powerful and memorable. Uh, the miracle of crossing the Jordan, the collapse of Jericho's walls, the halting of the sun and the moon in the sky. I always loved it. When I was a little kid, I thought, wow, that is way too cool. Well, through those miracles, Joshua delivered the people in the promised land and with a great and mighty demonstration of of God's power through the leadership of Joshua they came into the promised land they conquered the very first heavily fortified city of Jericho and so Joshua was in that way a savior he was a, a deliverer and so we see then a parallel when the angel appeared to Joseph and Mary, they said that the child in Mary's womb was to be named Jesus. So it wasn't that they named him. God named him. And he named him Jesus uh, because that word means Savior. He is he that is going to save or deliver uh, his people from their sins. And so <clears throat> the name is certainly a, a link between Jesus and Joshua. Think of something else? <clears throat> Obedient. You know, when we start out, and as a fact, let's go back and read this one text one more time in Joshua chapter 1. <clears throat> this is God who is speaking directly to Joshua and he just lays it out in verse 2, Joshua chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. All right, so now it's time to, uh, to get moving forward. Arise, God says, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm given to you. And then drop down to verse 6. God says, be strong and courageous. For you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. To be careful to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. For then 
you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Only be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. All right, so Joshua was challenged by God himself to follow God's law. And he was promised success if he obeyed. And throughout the book, Joshua, God tells Joshua to dedicate himself to the law of the Lord, not departing from it. And when you think to the right or to the left, uh, you think maybe even the smallest departures, minor variations, a tweak here, a, a, an alteration there, and God says no. No, because every time that there is going to be an alteration to God's law, that's an insult to God. That's not honoring God and respecting God as God because God doesn't make any mistakes. His law is perfect. And uh, so when we think of a perfect law, why would you want to change that law? Go to the left of that law or go to the right of, of that law. And so what we see as we study the book of Joshua is a man that's committed to that very thing to staying true to the Lord's law and its precepts. And he promises military success if he obeys the law of the Lord. And so Joshua, even with his imperfections, is a good example of allegiance to God and to his holy law. Then we can transfer that and start making parallels to, to Jesus. He perfectly kept the law. He determined to do the will of the Father, John 5 and verse 19. If Joshua led well by following the Lord and His word, how much more did Jesus, who perfectly obeyed the will of the Father? And so you see two men, both of which equally were committed to one common goal, and that was staying faithful to the law of the Lord. You know, we say this, and sometimes uh, maybe it doesn't resonate as powerfully in our minds as it should, but that honestly is totally my call. It's totally your call on the level of faithfulness that you're going to have to God's Word. Nobody can make you, nobody can force you, intimidate you into doing something to the right or to the left of God's Word. Joshua determined, Jesus determined, that they weren't going to deviate from God's law. Well, there's a takeaway from, from us. And our life should be a reflection upon the fact that we believe that God's word is, is holy and perfect in every way. And so everything that, the, that is said in the New Testament, everything that's a part of the gospel of Christ, is something that is without blemish, without fault. And everything God has done uh, is perfect. And if that's true, then I'm not going to want to mess with that. I'm not going to want to go even make the slightest of variations. Okay, good points. Anything else that you thought of? Excellent point. When we think about their leadership uh, obligations or challenges, <coughs> Joshua had a tough task. When, when you read in the, the book of, for example, Numbers, they were, they were a tough people. They were obstinate and stubborn and... Um, well, he had his hands full of trying to lead those people. But yet, as uh, he learned from Moses, uh, Joshua was one that stayed the course and uh, was determined to uh, provide the kind of leadership uh, that was necessary. And one of the things that I've, I've always liked about Joshua and the, and the book of Joshua are some of these little mini-sermons, if you'll allow me to uh, refer to them in that way, 
that, uh, that Joshua gives along the way that I think really illustrates uh, part of the kind of leadership that he had. Uh, for example, turn to chapter 23, Joshua 23. Corey, could I get you to read, please, 20, chapter 23, 3 through 11. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. See, I have, I have apportioned to you these nations which remain as an inheritance for your tribes with all the nations which I have cut off from the Jordan even to the great sea for the setting of the sun. The Lord your God, he will thrust them out from before you and drive them from before you. And you will possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods, or make anyone swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you are to cling to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you, and as for you, no man has stood before you to this day. One of your men puts to fight a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you, just as he promised you. So take diligent heed to yourself to love the Lord your God. All right. This is an amazing, uh, amazing section to me. Uh, if you break it down, he's got three observations followed by three admonitions. Three observations about God. First of all, he says, God fights for you. And when we, we think about what happened to Jericho, is that pretty good evidence that God fight for you? I mean, how many bricks did they need to, to knock down? They didn't have to do anything. God took care of the walls of Jericho for them. Or how about later on when uh, the sun stood still? Well, Joshua even says, it is the Lord who is fighting for you. And so he's making that point here uh, that God's on your side and he's fighting for you. He wants us to win. And we could certainly come up with some parallels uh, to that in the teachings of Jesus, who is, uh, his mission is to bring about success and that God is the one who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we might succeed. That's the, the whole message of, of Jesus. And then second, he says an observation about God that he has provided their inheritance verses 4 and 5. So God has delivered. He said He was going to give them, give you this land for your tribes, and uh, God's done that. So God doesn't give empty promises. He gives promises uh, that are fulfilled. And how many times do we think about the promises that Jesus gives in <clears throat> what God will do uh, for those that are faithful to Him. So you've got a parallel there. Uh, well, He provided their inheritance. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, God's going to provide our inheritance. And uh, Jesus talked about the uh, desire for eternal life and that I go to prepare a place for you, John 14, and texts like that where we think about an inheritance. And then third observation about God is he keeps his promises. 
He's not a God that just talks the talk and doesn't walk the walk. He's a, a God that says, I'm going to do this. And then he does uh, what he's going to do. You know, I, I have said this before, and some of you have heard me say this before, but I, uh, I keep a sermon, several sermons actually, in the back of my Bible, just in case I'm ever somewhere and somebody says, two minutes before it's time to begin, Denny, could you preach uh, for us this morning? Well, I've got sermons that are, that are ready to go. One of them that I've preached several times is called Judgment Day Surprises. Judgment Day Surprises. And one of the surprises is that the Lord meant what he said. People are going to be shocked that God did, in fact, mean what he said about the end of time and about Judgment Day and about everybody appearing before the judgment seat of Christ. So in Joshua's little uh, final sermon, and you might have noticed that Joshua saying, hey, I'm an old man, I'm advanced in years. Uh, so this is um, kind of my last raw sermon here. Uh, well, but God is one that keeps his promises. And they're living the reality of that. They know they can see they have experienced the fact that God uh, keeps His promises. Well, one of these Judgment Day surprises, hopefully not a surprise to any of us, but uh, some people are going to be surprised to find out God really did mean what He said. Uh, but we already knew that. And then Joshua follows that with uh, three admonitions. Admonition number one is... Obey Him. You've got a choice that is being made going forward on what are you going to do <clears throat> with your life. And so he says in verse 6, Be very firm then to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. God is not pleased with half obedience. He's not pleased with three-fourths of compliance. He says, be firm and do keep all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. And then he repeats, so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left. So, <clears throat> admonition number one is obey him. And then he has an interesting statement in verse 8. You are to cling to the Lord your God. What do you think of when you think of that kind of term? Would somebody have a different translation in verse 8 besides the word cling? All right, hold fast. All right, maybe, maybe that presents <clears throat> a better mental picture for you. But the idea certainly is that you're getting a vice grip on God, on His Word, on your commitment to Him. And no one is going to be able to pry your, you away from your allegiance to God. Now, practically speaking, what that means is that you're not going to be able to get me to not go to worship on Sunday. You're not going to be able to somehow get me to stop praying and stop studying. Uh, I'm, I'm holding on to God, and when I hold on to God... I recognize what that means in every day of my life, that I'm clinging to Him. I'm not going to let go of Him because you're going to cling to something. It's either God or Satan, according to Paul in Romans 6.16. 6, <clears throat> so you let go of God, then you've grabbed on to Satan. So I'm going to cling on to God, and I understand what that means as far as uh, obedience in my life and allegiance to Him. Well, then in um, verse 11, <clears throat> he has the third admonition, and that is, be diligent to heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. That certainly reminds us, doesn't it, of what Jesus taught about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. <clears throat> That's the greatest command, Jesus says. There's not, there's not another command that tops that one. Wow, that's, that's pretty significant. Well, uh, Joshua is given the same uh, sort of admonition. 
All right, so when we think about Joshua and the, the link to Jesus, we see those kind of, of lessons that are being taught as they're teaching the people of God, leading the people of God. All right, someone think of something else? What would you do by way of a lesson with Rahab? See any kind of parallel? in the story of Rahab and how Joshua dealt with her? Amy? Yeah. Rahab had a promiscuous life. Rahab was a Gentile. And so as a Gentile, she was among those that were to be exterminated. But yet, in spite of those things about her, one of the beautiful accounts is that she saw the, the truth in the work of God through Joshua, through the Israelites, through the stories that had made it to her ears. And so she sought out deliverance. And certainly Joshua might have considered her unworthy, but uh, she was one that looked for that salvation, that deliverance, and Joshua came through uh, for Rahab and her family. You know, Jesus offers salvation to the undeserving. And that would be you, by the way, and me. We are undeserving. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, while we were still sinners at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, even though while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he rescued us. Undeserving as we were, we still found the rescue that, uh, that God provides. And so I think there's a pretty cool uh, parallel with that. Another one that I thought of, and uh, maybe would make sense as well to you, is how Joshua conquered the enemies of God. As he moves into the promised land, there is a systematic division of the land, and the peoples that need to be conquered and then are going to be replaced with the people of God. Maybe the best memory that we have of Joshua is those military victories. Uh, we start with that heavily fortified city of Jericho. Conquering that city was a, a, a monumental initial test to uh, Joshua's leadership and the promise of God. Joshua is remembered as a warrior, a conqueror that fulfilled God's command to destroy these Canaanite armies and these Canaanite cities. Uh, and at the Battle of Ai, he's credited with uh, burning the city and executing its king in chapter 8. He executed the kings of the southern Canaanite coalition in chapter 10, had the city of Hazor burned in chapter 11. I mean, there are many stories, significant stories of success of Joshua conquering the enemies of God. Well, Jesus is presented as a conquering warrior at times in the New Testament, especially in the spiritual realm. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, The Son of Man appeared to destroy the works of the devil, John says. Uh, at the cross, God the Father disarmed the rulers and authorities of the angelic world put them to open shame, Paul would say in Colossians 2 and verse 15. Uh, Jesus defeated through His death and resurrection so that we can say, Oh, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Uh, well, that's only because of what uh, Jesus has done for us. Okay, we could go on. And I don't know if you're thinking, that this is kind of fun or not. But... Um, when there are those kind of parallels, uh, but let's, let's move on to the second guy. Maybe a little bit harder, 
um, to draw parallels, but that's Samson. Now, first of all, let's start. Are there some Samson events that also parallel Jesus events? Yeah, the prediction of his birth. You've got an angel in both cases that announce the miraculous birth uh, by an angel. Okay, so that's an interesting parallel between the two. God's chosen deliverer is before they're even born. Because Samson, in Judges 13... God says he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And then the angel, uh, Matthew 121, uh, talking about Mary, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then <clears throat> both Jesus and Samson had uh, the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, uh, Judges 14 and verse 6, talks about how the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. And then Jesus said uh, in Luke 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he says in Matthew 12 that, that he by the Spirit of the Lord is uh, driving out demons or casting out demons. Uh, both Samson and Jesus defeated God's enemies. Uh, both of them were betrayed for money. That's true. <clears throat> Delilah betrayed Samson. Judas betrayed Jesus. Both of them were bound and beaten. Uh, both had a victorious death. In Samson, it says in Judges 16 that he killed more, many more when he died than when he lived. And then with Jesus, Paul says in Colossians 2.15, And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. So there are, are, are parallels. Those are, I went through eight that we went through very quickly, but man, we could come up with 18. We could come up with a lot more than that. So Samson fought a physical battle. Jesus fought a spiritual battle. We, we totally get that. Um, but there are those kind uh, of parallels and how God worked in, uh, in both cases. All right, with the time we have left, we'll move on uh, to Boaz. And uh, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and call you out since we talked about it earlier. When we think of Boaz, we think of what? Redeemer. This whole idea of Redeemer is that which predominates the discussion in the book of, of Ruth chapter 4. And some observations about this idea of Redeemer. First of all, the re Redeemer involved both the person and an inheritance. The Le Levitical law in the book of Leviticus chapter 25 says, And after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. All right, so one of the requirements of redemption um, had to do with the person who was a kinsman, was related to whoever it was to be redeemed. And with Jesus, he is our brother. He is... One who, <clears throat> um, according to Galatians 4, 4 and 5, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so Boaz redeemed the parcel of land so that he might restore it to Naomi. He also removed all the encumbrances that were necessarily upon her uh, and Ruth. And so related to that, then, or just playing off of that a little bit more, you had to be a, a relative. 
And that's what Leviticus 25 and 49 is saying. And any that is near of kin unto him of his family may redeem him. And so Jesus is one that <clears throat> becomes uh, our brother and our redeemer. Another point is that the redeemer had to be able to redeem. He had to be able to redeem. The law not only required the redemption of the property, but included the obligation to raise up seed to the, to the deceased. As the kinsman redeemer, Boaz was not only able to buy back the property, but he was also able to take Ruth as his wife so that she might bear children. And in her case, the first one that was the closest relative he, he was ready to, to redeem. He said, I'll do it. But when he found out that there were other obligations and he wasn't just going to get the land, but he also uh, had to raise up a family and the land belongs to her. The land doesn't belong to him. He said, I am unable to redeem. But Boaz, whose name means strength, <laughs> had the strength uh, and the ability to do what... It, needed to be done well <clears throat> thankfully we have Jesus who can redeem us Jeremiah 50 verse 34 says their redeemer is strong the Lord of hosts is his name so we're not left with a hope that somebody can get the job done we need a redeemer uh, Ruth couldn't do this on her own Naomi couldn't do this on her own uh, Boaz stepped in, Jesus steps in, he could do it, Jesus for our eternal life can do it. He said, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He says later on in John 10, no one can take it from me, but I lay down the life of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. So Jesus is able to redeem. And then one quick point as we <clears throat> wrap up. The Redeemer has to pay the price in full. The, Levitical, the Levitical law demanded, let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overpayment unto the man to whom he sold it. Leviticus 25, 27. So, the idea of a credit deal when you're talking about redemption, that was not the way it worked. The full price and more had to be paid for the land. Nothing was to be lacking. The payment was to be made in full. And then Peter says, in making an application to Jesus, For as much as ye know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver and gold from your former manner of life, that was received from your fathers, but were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. The blood of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we have a redeemer. Uh, and, you know, Job said, I know that my redeemer lives. We've made a, a song off of those words. But we can sing those words knowing what passages like 1 Peter 1 assures us. Um, that, that we have a Redeemer. So an interesting and wonderful parallel between the story of Boaz and his redemption and the ultimate eternal redemption that we have in Christ. Okay, time for us to quit. Um, you gonna...